So hello everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here. My name is. Give me a second. I just start on time because I might need that. My name is Frederik Schaff, and I just started, uh, well, doing science within archaeology. Um, although I am not an archaeologist, so I am an economist by profession. I'm a trained economist, and I did my PhD in economics um, at the University of Hagen, which is a distant learning university here in Germany. And currently I'm working at both University of Hagen and University of Bochum, where I joined a project in June last year called Resources in Society from the Leibniz Society, um, together with the Deutsches Bergbau Museum, where I'm settled. It's a um, project with postdocs, where there are archaeologists from different uh, parts of archaeology, and I am bringing the um, expertise, um, if you want to say, so I know something of ancient based modeling. I don't know if I'm an expert um, in there about ancient based modeling. So that's the idea. And um, perhaps one remark, because many people who are not economists and even many people who are economists um, have a very narrow mindset about what an economist is. So it makes you and you think everybody is a perfect calculation machine. And so I'm not. So. Um, uh, I, if, so perhaps that's important to know. And in my um, in my PhD thesis, I was already interested in some themes which were just discussed in the in the last two um, presentations, which is about the role of time and how how you can you how can you represent time in models. And that's why I got got stuck with ancient based models because there you can it. Normally, most most models we use in um, economics, where we are mostly interested in how markets work, um, are equilibrium models. And if you want to have some uh, time scale, like in archaeological history, you have this naturally, um, something happened in some certain time scales, then you cannot work with these models. You need some disequilibrium models, which make sense at each point of time. So you need to have a time scale in the model, which is very interesting, intriguing, but it's complicated. And it's complicated if you want to have behavior, if you want to model agents uh, with some real behavior, if you want to do that, just some of these problems. So today, I'm going to talk about um, my start in this science and I'm utilizing the artificial analysis model. So it's not bad that you did not tell anything about it because I'm going to tell very briefly about it. I guess everybody knows this model, which is one, as I understand it, one of the first agent based models in um, archaeology, which originates uh, from the Santa Fe Institute in, uh, in US um, from the also well known Sugarscape model, um, which is also one of the first agent-based models and in, in um, economics perhaps if you take some other models which I don't know shelling model you might know this this is a sociological or ecological model this is an agent-based but, but I won't, don't want to go into details here so this Anasazi model is about this valley um, where in a time scale um, also before 800 but they uh, they look at 800 to 1350 um, uh, uh, so the people of, of the Anasazi lived and they grew maize um, for their living and then they abandoned the valley, perhaps something around 1350. And they have gathered a lot of data in this project, um, um, which they wanted to use to utilize to understand what happened there. Okay, I, I don't, don't want to go into these details, only let's say they have a lot of data. And I was trying to um, have a starting point for my idea about um, an explicit knowledge representation, I will come to that later, so about how you can model behavior and coordination in a, let's say, more natural way, more explanatory way, where you can have more causation. Um, and so I took this model as a starting point because I needed to have some starting point. And the first thing I, I want to do is to, um, into, to uh, re-implement re it in the software I am using, which is LSD. It's not the drug, it's uh, called Laboratory for Simulation Development. Um, uh, it's a C++ based software, so it's very powerful and you can use everything you want from C++. Um, why I got stuck with this and not with popular NetLogo, um, which is perhaps more easy to learn, but might have some problems, um, especially from an economics point of view. Here is not that, uh, because you are always thinking this two dimensional things, which is not natural to economic problems. Often here it is more because you have key information systems uh, data. So um, there were in this model, so the, the original code is, I did not get this, a C++ code also, but then there is a re-implementation of this model, uh, I will show it later, in Java, which you can get, 
And there is also the re-implementation by Janssen and NetLogo, which is also um, open source. You can download it on OpenABM and it got an award for being very nicely written and documented. And so I, I thought it's a good point to start. And then I had this data and the first thing I found, it's very difficult to understand what this data really is because there is no documentation and each of these data files is one line with thousands of entries only separated by some space. So you have to go into the code and read how they, read how they use this data. And I did this and in the end, now I am ready to really use the data the same way as Janssen did it and which is hopefully the same way they did it in the past. And so just to show you this, there is some visual comparison of the, um, of the data. Um, at the starting point, this is the yield and the more dark zones, there is a higher yield, a higher maze yield. And you can see it's, it's difficult to see it because I have other color used in my implementation, um, but it's the same. And also for this parameter called hydro, hydrology, I think it's about um, whether or not it's, it's a flat plane. So it's about the sediment, if it's growing or degrowing, meaning if it's a flat plane uh, uh, site or not. And this is important for settling because you would not settle somewhere where there can be a flood, uh, where there can be water. And then you have also these uh, data on the water sources, which is about uh, water you, that you can use for living, for drinking. It's not about the growing part, but you need to be living somewhere close to this water. Okay, and these are the different zones in this valley which are important. And um, yeah, so prior to implementation were, are these um, Java implementation, the Net logo implementation by Janssen, which I advanced a little bit because I, for example, I needed to, um, to get the data uh, so I can, can check my model if it's, if it's doing what it should be doing with the data and stuff like this. What you see here is, um, uh, it's a bit small, but you can see it's still, this is the capacity, which is what the land um, allows to how many, how many households the land allows to live in this region. Um, and the red line is the actual number of households and the blue line, uh, no, the red line is the, yes, the actual number of households, the blue line, you cannot see, it, is the historical uh, number of households. What you can see quite clearly here already is that the model is very much driven by the capacity. And that's also something which I found by the re when I re-implemented it, and that's another implementation, and that's a view of my implementation, so I can also produce these nice pictures although I don't use them normally, um, but I can do so, and you can do so there. Um, so um, this model is very much driven by the data, which is not so good. And it was very complicated, much more complicated than I thought to reproduce, to re-implement the model. So I will give you a small move through this model. I think that's also for those who are, I guess everybody here is acquainted with agent-based modeling and has done some agent-based modeling, or perhaps not. For those who are not, it might be interesting to see how such a model really works, what are the pieces. So I will use here a UML, Unified Modeling Language, main class model, which simply will point to you the main objects in this model, okay? So we have our model here, and it's also too small to read, um, sorry for that. And um, based in, in this model, we have a population model, which is here, okay? And this population model basically uses some settings. Most of these settings are hard-coded in the in the model, so they are not used for sensitivity analysis. For example, the typical household size or how much um, how much maize a household needs to eat to not die, something like this. Then we have an environmental component, and in this environmental component, we have our environmental model, which basically is a geographic. Oh, sorry, the geographical uh, interface in this model, and we have these data from the from the data files, which is feeding the environmental model. Then what is most important, because it's, we have this geographical resolution, um, we have the land patch, which is a single patch on the grid, basically, which has some properties, like if it is a water source or not, and we have another kind of agent, um, which also in the net local model is, is implemented as a kind of agent, which is the water point, which basically, um, uh, if a water point is associated to a land patch, then this land patch might, have, might be a water source at some points in time so that you can get water there, okay? And then we have the behavioral model, if you want. We have the households. In the uh, implementations, um, yet there are no persons. Every household is um, related, to, uh, stands for five persons, if you want so. And um, each household wants to settle at one point at the land patch, 
and he also wants to have a farm. Okay? And at each patch, there can only be one farm, but there can several households living on the same patch. So there is a similar thing, it can only be one of those related on the land patch. So this kind of model of a model gives you an overview, which I think is quite nice, and it's, it's very useful for um, communication. It's also very useful for understanding and for implementing a model. So I guess it's good to do something like this, um, and also using this. I, I won't explain what these marks say, but they all have a different meaning. Okay. So what is very important when we talk about time is the updating scheme. So in which in which order are things carried out in the model? And again, I cannot go into details here because of the time, um, but this is from uh, Swidmund and others, which are some, some of these authors are original, uh, the original authors of the original Artificial Amazazi project, and they are also currently um, trying to, um, as I read in two publications, trying to advance this and implement persons and make it a bit more behavioral. But I, from, from two lines, I read that it's not working as easy as they thought perhaps, but I did not get any information. So if anybody has some information or if even somebody of these people is here, I would be very interested in that. Um, first thing is that this um, schedule here is not the schedule which is in the code from Janssen. And I, I believe very strongly it's not the schedule which is in the original model because there are some contradictions which work, simply do not work then. For example, here if we start here, we have um, the um, we determine if a household has enough to eat and then later on we determine the harvest for this day and um, so he needs to eat what was there in the past some of his stock household can have stocks okay and then he will determine if there is enough food for the next year assuming that uh, with a very myopic um, assumption that he will harvest the same as before and then he will resettle or not and if he's not and then there will also be the decision to get children and it, basically it's a decision in the model and here it's a bit, um, here it's, well, there is a chance to get children. If you get children, then these children, this new household will get a, get a share, 30% of the maize you have on stock from the old household. And then this new household may find a good spot to live or he may die. And there are some things which are not very clear here and in the papers. It's basically um, first, before the, the household gets a child household, um, it checks whether this new household could actually live in the environment. Only then it gets a child household. Because if I implemented it first in this way, and then I got the problem, they gave maize to the children, but the children did not find some place to live, so they died, and the parents died the next day because they did not have enough maize. <laughs> and that's also why you need to change this. So process is very important. Okay? And um, this is just the explanation of a very important so the most, most important process in this model is the resettle decision. So if they move from one patch of land to another patch of land to, um, with their farm to, to get maize, to grow maize at another patch and also to live there. Live there. Okay? And you can also again draw a decision tree using an activity model. Okay? So we have some start and then go on. And what I added here, again I cannot go into details, I hope these presentations will be thank you, distributed later on, so otherwise you can mail me and I can send it to you if you have some, uh, want to take a look at it. Um, one element which is here, which I call the environmental broker, because basically in this model there is some kind of environmental broker who says um, if an agent wants to, to, uh, to have a new position where he wants to farm, um, take this spot that's the best one. So there's perfect information if you want. Okay, and. Um, and that's not very, so there is no coordination on this aspect, which is most central and most difficult. Perhaps that's why they did not, and it's from the end of 90s, so I would not say it's bad they did not do this. Um, it's a very nice model and it was very good, but now we should do differently. And now in the, I don't know what this is. I simply press OK, I'm fine, I buy it. This machine, machine. and um, so this is a more complicated, um, Diagram. So this is a diagram as explained in the paper. Okay, very simple. Um, you try, you check if you need to need to resettle. Um, if not, if yes, you do. If not, it's end. Um, if you want to resettle, you check if there is a nice place for a farm. If yes, you go on and find a nice place to live. And if you cannot find a nice place for a farm, so you are not sustained anymore by this environment, you go away. So you cannot overshoot the capacity, which is important because otherwise the dynamics will lead to uh, well people dying at a row. 
at some point. At least that happened with my uh, causal runs. So it's not a, but it's, it's problematic. So they did a lot to, to keep it in place. And then if you look at the code from Janssen, um, who looked at the code from the original model uh, to re-implement it, it gets even more complicated. And also, as you can see here, there are some decisions uh, which are no decisions. So I found it does not make any difference. Um, so this is also not to say anything to Janssen. He was perfectly keeping to the old model. That was his idea, to re-implement the old model as it was. But if you choose such a representation, it helps you to not make such mistakes and to be more clear. Okay? So there are some, some things which are not in this model. I'm running out of time. I'm sorry for this. So I will not go into detail about this question. I talked a bit about this. But what I, so you can see, I can re-implement it and do, make some graphs. But I, what I want to talk really about, just briefly, is how you can change such a model to make it more realistic. And that is by, well, we also talked about this, really taking time as time. So taking into account the irrevocable nature of time. Something that happened, happened, and you can never get back to this state again. Okay, you can, you can reach a similar state at some point, but you can never get back to this state again. And this means that also the decision process that, which you implement for your agent needs to take into account this idea of irrevocability of time. That means that you need to have, basically, uh, we also had this word of simulacrum before, which I like uh, very much and I'm using also. So we can build agents which have their own model. And in this model, they put some objects, some things they encounter in the virtual reality. Okay? And these things they encounter, they use for their decision process. So they have their own internal representation. And you can do that with an agent-based model, and it's fine. Okay? And this means now that if, I take a if my agent takes a decision at some point of time, he takes this decision based on his internal model, which might be wrong in some senses. So he might think that there is something present still, uh, that there is something present still in the reality, which is not. Okay? So his decision is very wrong, if you want. And he might not consider something which is there, which was not there before, because he did not experience it yet. And you can do so by explicitly having models, which I call also simulacrum, so simulacra in uh, plural, for each of the objects which are relevant for the reality. So you have, for example, the person who knows some other persons. You have the network that I represented in my models by giving the person the possibility to get to know persons. And if he does so, he will have add a simulacrum of this person to his own model. And this simulacrum is connected to the real person. But if this real person dies, he only knows it if somebody tells him or if he tries to interact with this person and sees, oh, it's not there anymore. And he does so based on the information he has in a simulacrum. Okay, so that's, it, it is complicated, but it's possible and it makes thing, things nice. And so you can have methods for each agent to perceive the environment, to store this information in the mental model, to take decisions based on this, to carry out actions based on this. You need, of course, to take care that, is, that what happens if there is a conflict, so if you try to talk to a person which is not there anymore, but it's possible. Um, and, um, well, it's, it's possible and there is this credo, if you didn't grow it, you didn't explain its emergence. So if you take such a stance, you can really explain how information diffuses and how the, the outcomes can be explained by the information which is distributed, different, and myopic, and subjective for each agent. So... Yeah, I skip that. So we come to the end. There are also some references there. Thank you very much. Thank you.